be seated. Let us all be seated. God is good. Amen, 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 amen. You know, one of the things um, interesting about the times that we're living in, I was reviewing some of the prophecies of Enoch earlier. And um, one of the things that he talked about, he was so excited at the things that were being revealed to him. And um, I know that many people are like, oh, how come we don't see Enoch's name through several passages of scripture? I'm like, well, you may not see his name everywhere, but in a few places, however, you would see other people quoting his prophecies. People like Jude, people like David, even Jesus made references to the things that he said. And Apostle Paul again and again will reference the things that he said. And I mean, nothing gives validity more to that which had been prophesied by Enoch more than the ministry of the apostles who not only lived out what was being said, but also made sure that it was included in their letters. And one of the things that he said that I was meditating upon was the fact that when he was being shown the things of God, he got so excited because the angel of the Lord revealed to him also that in the last days, the things that have been revealed to you, son of man, shall be revealed to others. And that's why we saw in the prophecy of Isaiah, praise God, thank you, Alan. Isaiah said, in the last days, darkness will cover the earth. However, in, also, in those last days also, the knowledge of the glory of God shall fill the earth. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And while I was meditating, then my brother called me. And you know, when you call me when I'm meditating on scriptures, I'm gonna, you're going to be my first student. And so when he called me, I was like, well, you want to talk about this, but I've got something that I want to talk about. I said, have you wondered why God took Enoch? The Bible says Enoch walked with God. And God took him. Enoch was walked with God and he was not. That means he walked with God and then after a while he was no longer here because God took him so that he did not taste death. And he said, yeah, I know that. I said, but why? Have you thought about the fact that it was the knowledge of God that he possessed that qualified him for such a rapture before all raptures? Because when you look at the generation that we are in right now, the Bible says that of this generation, because Jesus was speaking to two generations at the same time. He was speaking to a cross section of people and he said to them, what if I said to you that there are some amongst you who will not see death until they see the son of man come in his glory. He was talking about the people that were there because he knew that John the beloved would see him. And then he said to them, what if I said to you that some would actually be caught up and then he was talking about us. You've heard me teach on that subject of the two generations, the two witnesses that Jesus spoke to. And he distinguished them by the signs that they would experience. He said there was, he said no sign will be given to this generation except for the sign of Jonah. Then he was talking about the present generation because he said no other sign will be given to you except for the sign of Jonah who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He said for so shall the son of man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And then immediately he also spoke to another generation. He says this sign shall be given to this generation that in their time it will be as in the days of Noah. And was it like the days of Noah in the time of Apostle Peter and Paul? No, it wasn't. But it was, but it is now becoming as the days of Noah in our generation. He says in the days of Noah, they were married and given in marriages. They were building houses. And that was as much as he said, but he gave them a pointer. If you go back in history and study more about what was going on in the time of Noah, then you will see that we are living in the times of Noah. In the times of Noah, the reprobate mind reigned supreme. And it was said in the days of Noah that women lost the fullness of the knowledge and purpose of God for their existence and they started to lust one after another. Those were the things that happened in the days of Noah. And now look at what is happening in today. Today, one of the key descriptors of the times that we're living in is women no longer want to stay in the place where they glorify God, in the place where they allow the family unit to stay intact, in the place where they allow children to be raised in the admonition of the things of God, in the place wherein they are truly helping the lives of men of God. Because the thing is, God put women in such a special place, but the enemy came with his lies to trivialize the position of women. And the Bible says that would happen because the reprobate mind will be introduced again. 
Romans chapter 1 verse 20. You can read it to 26, 27. And so we know that there were, there were two generations that Jesus would address again and again. And this is that generation that will experience the knowledge of the glory of God. And are we not experiencing the knowledge of the glory of God? Look at the things that we know today that we didn't know before. I'm talking about the last couple of years. We, we read the book of Revelations now and it makes sense. The books like Hosea now make sense. Book like, books like Nahum now make sense. Prophecies that David spoke again and again that we thought were just about the battles that he was fighting with the Philistines are now making sense as prophecies directed to the church. How many of us read and meditated upon Isaiah 45 for years without knowing that we were Cyrus? <laughs> How many of us, we, we saw the miracles that Jesus performed and it isn't until now that we're beginning to recognize that pretty much every miracle that Jesus performed was a prophecy to the church. And now when we read the miracles of the madman of the gatherings, we're like, wow, that is the church. When we read the resurrection of Lazarus, we're like, oh my goodness, if only we knew. Even the names of the people in the life of Jesus and in his ministry were names of people describing the church. And so we know that we have come to that time wherein the knowledge of the glory of God fills the earth. And if that was exactly what Enoch had that other people did not have, could that also be the prerequisite for a taking away for a catching away he raptured because this man in fact do you know that he said concerning himself he said after having experienced that which happened to me through the ministry of the angels of God I stood and all I could say was give thanks to God he said because now I have seen what no other man has seen and so when he began to write his parables he began the very opening chapter of his writings he says this is addressed to the generation of the last day and that was why when Jude was quoting Enoch, he says, I tell you what Enoch, the seventh from Adam said, because everything about the life and the ministry of Enoch was for the seventh day, the seventh generation. This is the seventh day, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the day of rest. This is the generation of Noah. If you don't know, Noah means rest. And that is the reason why we're experiencing the troubles of Noah so that we can appreciate the rest of Noah. Because let me tell you something, if you have not been troubled and somebody offers you rest, it doesn't mean anything. If you've just slept for 20 hours and you finally wake up, the last thing you want to do is go back to sleep. Unless you're possessed with the demon of laziness. You know, but anybody who is in their right minds and in their right form, after having slept for hours, what do you want to do? You want to get up and do something. You see what I mean? And so what happens is, after much rest, you want work. But then after much work, what do you want? You want rest, particularly if the work is not just ordinary work, if it is amidst a lot of trouble. Every time there's been an exodus, that's one of the characteristics preceding an exodus. Work becomes trouble mixed with work. Remember the children of Israel. They went to work every day for hundreds of years. Nobody complained about much. They would pray to God for deliverance, but they went to work. But then as soon as they were getting close to the Exodus, the Bible says that Pharaoh made a decree that they would no longer receive straw for making bricks. So they were supposed to do what? Make bricks without straw. And so that which they were doing, they were, they were still required to do, but it was more difficult. So that when eventually they get into that wilderness and God gives them rest, and quenches their thirst, they will have such an appreciation of it and say like David said, this is the Lord's doing. And so I want to encourage you that the times that we're in is a time wherein if we are going to rise above the odds, if we are going to be caught up like Enoch was caught up, like Elijah was taken up, like Moses was taken up, if we would be, then we would have to imbue ourselves with the knowledge of the Most High God. I say to you again and again, there is no time like the time that we're in that is so suitable for studying the word of God. Let me tell you something, when you open the Bible now, it's, it's light. It's like you can literally dive in and begin to enjoy fresh revelation. So what is holding you back? I know that I'm sounding like a broken record, but in reality, these times that we're in, pray, study the word, pray, study the word, pray, study the word. 
Anything that does not align with studying the word of God and praying. Someone says, oh, but I've got bills to pay. I know that you have bills to pay, but I'm telling you, you need to put premium on praying, spending time with God and studying his word. Before you were born, people paid bills. And if the Lord delays his coming, the ones coming after you will pay even more bills. Oh yeah, even more bills. You see, my dad never paid for a mobile phone bill because he didn't have one until I got him one. But now our children are paying for things that we do not know. Recently, our little daughter Aria was talking to me about one of her subscriptions that needed renewing. And I'm like, what subscription? She told me what it was. I'm like, did you say purchase or renewal? She says renewal. That means someone's been paying for it. She was like, yes, you. You have been paying for it. I was like, wait a minute. How much is it? When she told me, I screamed. Because I'm like, oh my goodness. How did I even agree to pay for that? Oh my God. And that is the reason why we cannot afford to make our lives about bills because heaven and earth will pass away. But the Bible says not a tittle of the word of God will pass away. So if you don't want to pass away with heaven and earth, fill yourself with the word of God and you are guaranteed of eternal life. I tell you every now and again that deep calls to deep. In one of the songs that we were singing earlier, I was talking about that the oceans, the crashing of the waters. What did David say? David said that when I got to the place of the fountain of the Lord, where it was bursting forth, it says deep began to call unto deep. If deep is calling unto deep, then what is in you that will, res- that will, that will resonate with what is in God? It is very crucial. It is very critical for us to recognize that there's been a shift. Let me tell you something, folks. I was listening to a dear friend of ours the other day, and he said a sound. Sounds come out of heaven, but not everybody hears it. Everyone knows there's something happening, but their perception is not always clear. Remember when Jesus was speaking to the Father at the tomb of Lazarus. He said, for the sake of the ones here, I will say this part of my prayer out loud. Father, I thank you because you hear me always. And then the father responded. And when the father responded, he spoke to Jesus. But the Bible says that the men that were around, they heard lightning. They heard a sound indeed, but they did not make out what was being said. The father was speaking lovingly to his son, but to the unsuspecting civilians who were around, it was just noise. And so when you look at the world around us today, there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of chaos, wars, and rumors of war. But every war, every rumor of war represents a trumpet that is sounding out of heaven. To some people, it is just noise. But to you as a believer, you need to be able to hear the instructions that have been issued in righteousness. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2, they were together in one place and in one accord, and there came from heaven, what? A sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Again, in Acts chapter 4, verse 30 to 31, the Bible says, there came again a sound from heaven. A sound is always coming from heaven to shake the earth. But some people, all they experience is the earthquake. But the ones who have ears to hear, they actually hear the voice of God. And one of the things that God is calling us and asking for us to do in these last days is to put a premium on his word. He says, Martha, Martha, why are you bothered about all these things when only one thing is needful and Mary has chosen that part? And what did Mary choose? Mary chose to sit at the foot of Jesus. I'm going to tell you a couple of things that the Lord's revealed to me, some of which I have shared in the past. I may just repeat them briefly about the reason why you need to study the word of God. The Bible says that for a man of God to be thoroughly furnished and made perfect unto every good work, he must have the scriptures. If you are going to be thoroughly furnished, what does it mean to be thoroughly furnished? To be adequately equipped against things that may come. So when we live in such a time wherein we are about to experience things that have not necessarily happened before, at least not in the way that they will happen, we need to equip ourselves with the word of God so that we can withstand in the evil day. What did God tell us as COVID-19 was approaching? Nobody knew what was going on, but the spirit of the Lord revealed it. 
I, I keep saying it. January 11th, 2020, the Lord said to me, he said, anoint the people present here against the epidemic that is coming so that their hearts will not fail them for fear. And we got people out and we anointed them with oil. And in addition to that, the Holy Spirit said to me, as they are going back to their seats, tell them to lay hold of a scripture and a promise in the word of God for themselves and their families to be the anchor for their souls as the wind of fear is blown through the news. The Lord made it very clear that the pandemic was going to be in the news. There was more attack coming from the news than was in the air. Because what we saw in 2020 into 2021 was the, prof was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Toward the end of Jeremiah's life, God gave him an opportunity to see the end of days. And he says in one year, there was a rumor. And it was a rumor of war. He said after a while, it subsided. And he said in another year, it came again. And then the end came. So we know that there is yet another rumor that is coming. Let me tell you something, it doesn't matter how serious it is, it doesn't matter how many evidences or facts that anybody is putting out, if anything is being told to you that is different from what God has said about you, it is not the truth. The Bible says you shall not die, but live to declare the works of God. The Bible says he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, not of any man or corporation, but I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Another wind is coming, but how do you ensure that you are thoroughly furnished? You need to have the scriptures. About a couple of months ago, I reminded us about the unspoken word of God. When Jesus came, he started his ministry with the unspoken word, which is the written word of God. And so if you don't know that which is already written, how are you able to withstand the temptation when it comes? But this is perhaps my favorite reason why you need to study the word of God. The Bible says, and this was Jesus speaking, he said that a scribe that is instructed in the things of God will bring from his treasures things both old and new. So if you are going into famine, do you want the ability, the divine ability to be able to make things appear from the treasure that God has put within you? Oh, you didn't hear the question. You see, famine has been prophesied and now we're seeing that some men are partnered with Satan to make sure that that famine really happens. You've been hearing in the, um, but maybe not so much in the news because the news is trying to suppress a lot of the evidences of the times that we're in. But when you look very well and closely online, you will know that several food storages have been set on fire. Several farms have been catching fire mysteriously. And when things like that begin to happen, it is recipe for famine. When money is being printed and being issued almost for no reason, then you know that famine is inevitable because the Bible lets us know that the third man of the apocalypse will bring, the third horseman of the apocalypse will bring famine upon the earth. How? By inflation. The Bible says that when the third, the third horseman appeared, he was riding a black horse and he had in his hand a pair of scales. And from that moment, a quart of wheat started selling for a denarii. A denarii was about a day's wage just to buy a quart of wheat that can only make about one and a half loaves of Hawaiian bread. Which is not enough for some people to just devour while they're watching the TV show. But then it's going to go for a year's wage. That's what the Bible says. But the thing that we need to pay attention to was that he had a pair of scales. Oh, some of you haven't gotten it. You see, because people are saying, oh, but we're still not paying a day's wage for a loaf of bread. Yeah, that's because the guy has a pair of scales. <laughs> you see, when you are the one controlling the scale and the scale that you are holding is hidden from the people, that's why it's called the dark horse, then people don't really know what's going on behind this scene. What you're seeing, the prices that you're seeing are being rigged by the scale of the horseman. But the reality of it is if you look very closely at the indices of the economy, then you will know that what you're paying is not what you should be paying. But the scale is only for a while. Immediately what followed? 
famine. When the price of an item becomes exorbitant, what does that mean? When things are becoming overly priced, that is inflation. Inflation is defined as a situation within an economy wherein there is more currency that is chasing goods and services. And so the moment you tell people to sit at home and not produce and not work, but then you start handing people money, what's going on? There is more currency than goods and services being produced. And so if you keep telling us that the price of gas is falling, then we know that that is nothing but a lie because in reality it should rise because now everybody has more money. And so I tell you this so that you know without gain saying that the time would come wherein there would not be as much. So how do you want to feed? How do you want to provide for your family, for your household? How do you want to ensure that your sustenance is guaranteed? The Bible says you need to be filled with the word of God. Because there was nothing made that was made without the word. The very first time the Lord started to show me about the things that we're going to see shortly. Like I told you, COVID-19 was just a rehearsal. The reality of what was being planned by the elitist authorities under Lucifer is about to be made plain. But before then, the Lord had shown it to me, August 2015. And one of the things that I saw, the vision began from the house of the saints. I saw their house and their storage. And what happened was every time they took a supply from their storage, it was replenished. Almost like those automated, uh, what do you call them, shelves at the store. The spring-loaded shelves. When you take a bottle, it pushes another one in its place. I saw that. That was the first thing that I saw. And immediately I knew what God was showing me. God was showing me that it was time for us to remind ourselves who the provider really is. Under the government of the Antichrist, everything that will be done will be done to mimic what Jesus did. Everything. Because the word anti means in place of. I've said that again and again. The Antichrist wants to look like Christ. He wants to look like the Savior. People will love the Antichrist. People will sing his praises. He will bring technology. The Bible says his administration will be full of lying wonders. He will bring such technology that we have not seen before. The lame will walk. And some of you already know that there is such technology that is being introduced to us that would allow for the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Such technology is being made available. And the ministry of the Antichrist is going to mimic everything that you have seen in the life of Jesus and in his ministry. They would try to count counterfeit. And why is the devil doing that? Because the devil recognizes that when Jesus came, remember what Constantine, I believe it was Constantine, who said this. He said, I can't get my generals to die for me. Even though I promised them lands that they can never walk, even if they live 10 times the number of their years. He said, and yet they will not die for me. He said, but I have heard of a group of people, a sect of men who call themselves those of the way. He says, and they would die for a man that they never met because he died for them. You know what he said? This Roman Caesar. He says, rather than continuing to beg people and to bribe them to die for their emperor, he said, I would rather find men who will believe what this sect believes so that they can die freely. You know why? Because they were trying to suppress the witnesses. They were trying to suppress Christians. And they couldn't. Because they couldn't get them to renounce the name of Christ. They would rather die. They would rather be crucified and burnt upside down than to renounce the name of Christ. And he looked and he was like, what did he promise you? And they would say to them, he already delivered his promise. He already saved us. And that was the story of how the Roman Catholic Church was born. He said, look, we're going to convert all of these idols into whatever things they believe in so that if we can get these soldiers to believe in the cross, then there's no battle that we cannot send them into. It's, it's public information, what I am telling you. It's not even particularly revelation. You can go look it up. And so why is the devil doing that? Because the devil knows that whatever God does works. So if Satan's strategies will stand a chance, they have to mimic the strategy of God as closely as possible. Like I've told you, the most believable lie is one that is closest to the truth. The most believable lie, believable lie is the one that is closest to the truth. 
If I suddenly came here and I told you that my previous career was playing in the NBA, you'd be like, can you take off your shoes, first of all? Let's see how tall you really are. You understand what I mean? I don't look like an NBA player. They're usually a little taller than I am. But then if I said to you that when I was at school in the UK, I played soccer, I played in the junior league, that might be somewhat believable, even though my legs are not bow enough. But at least I somewhat kind of have a frame that looks like that. That would be more believable. And that's what Satan does. He tries to mimic the truth, and Jesus is the truth. So when the Antichrist comes, he will mimic Jesus as closely as he can. In fact, Jesus says he will come in my name. And what does it mean to come in his name? The Antichrist is not going to call himself Jesus, but he will present himself as the Savior. He would even try to perform resurrection from the dead by making an image and then causing the image to have life and then to speak. And we're getting geared up for all of that. But how do you tell what is really going on if you don't know what has already been written? So I want to encourage you, get yourself grounded in the presence of God so that when they are performing lying wonders out there, you will look out through your window and you're like, eh, sorry, that's not for me. Because if you are not careful, the Bible says the deception will be so great that even the elect will be deceived. We're talking about people whose names are already in the Lamb's book of life. The elect. And by their actions, they would tell God, you may delete my name now because I have found myself another God. People will do that by their actions. And it is written, the Bible says in the book of Revelations that and they will be punished along with Satan, those whose names are no longer found. So wait a minute, no longer? That means there was once that their names were there. Because you can't say that you're once saved and forever saved. That okay, I once believed in Jesus and now that I believe in the Antichrist, I should still go to heaven. No, that's not how it works. The condition for going to heaven is this, whosoever believes. The day of judgment comes if you're no longer believing. It's over. The Bible never said whoever once believed. Do you know that you can believe now and no longer believe? That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If belief is only one time, then why did Paul say that I have fought the good fight of faith? I have kept the faith. Some people once believed, but when the Antichrist came, comes, they will start believing in the Antichrist. And the requirement for believing in the Antichrist is to deny the Christ. Because Jesus said it, you cannot serve two masters. It is either you love one and you hate the other. And that is the reason why so much hate is there for the name of Jesus today. Because the Antichrist needs the condition of the mind of, minds of people to be able to love him and hate the Lord. A lot of people, you want to talk to them about God today and they're like, if there is a God, why are children being trafficked? In, why are children being trafficked? Why is there earthquake? Why is there this and why is there that? And I'm like, that, that means you're really foolish if you're asking those questions. Because if you have any ounce of wisdom, then you will know that God set man here upon the face of the earth. As the Bible says, God has placed man under the sun that he may be exercised. If everything is on a bed of roses, then how do we ever learn anything? You, let, you remember my illustration of the professor of math? A math professor wants his child to be like him. He doesn't keep him at home, feeding him all day and letting him play video games. No, he sends him to school where instructors give him problems. Because you cannot master the art of problem solving if you have never faced problems. You can't tell me that you are the creator. If I haven't seen anything you've created, everything was already here when you got here. But God is the creator because when he got here, the Bible says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. To be formless and to be without void is indicative of lack of creativity. No one's created structure and there is no content. But six days later, wow, everything was beaming with life. Then we say, blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, the maker of the heavens and the earth. And so if you are going to be like your heavenly father, a problem solver, you need to be faced with problems. Recently, I was reminded that as believers, we do not have the right to complain about what's going on in the world. We don't. Because many of us complain about two things mostly in this generation. And what are they? We complain 
that there is too much darkness in the world. Okay. But the Bible says you are the light of the world. Many of us complain that the world is becoming so corrupt. Politicians corrupt. Businesses corrupt. Corporations corrupt. New, young generation, musicians, you know, producers of movies, entertainers, everybody speaking corruption. And we're like, oh, these people are so corrupt. And guess what? The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. When you have salt doing what it's supposed to do, what is the purpose of salt? Jesus says salt is there for preservation. And so if you preserve the world, there will be no corruption. You see what I mean? And so we cannot complain about the things that we are supposed to fix. But if we haven't studied the word of God, how do we even know who we are? Praise the Lord. Today we're going to pray as a continuation somewhat of where we were on Tuesday. Remember that on Tuesday we read from the book of Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. And what we read is that the Lord has for himself a man ahead of Jesus is coming. We're going to read from verse 1 today, Matthew chapter 3. The Bible says, in, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I just have a leading to quickly tell you something that I said about a year and a half ago, maybe, but I see new faces here who may not have heard me say that. We are without excuse. There are just way too many signs around us to let us know that we are that generation upon whom the end of the ages have come. When Jesus left, he said as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. In the days of the Son of Man, it will be as it was in the beginning. So God has already shown signs again and again in Scripture that we are meant to look for when the time comes to receive the Savior. And so what did Jesus tell us about the gospel? He said to his disciples, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, beginning where we're at now, in Jerusalem. But from Jerusalem, where was the gospel meant to be taken next? Judea. He says, from Jerusalem, you go to Judea. And when he comes, where will he establish his administration once again? In Jerusalem. The Bible says that when the Lord of, when Jesus returns, he will set foot upon the Mount of Olives and establish his kingdom and from there reign upon the earth. And so basically, if the gospel started from Jerusalem, where is it meant to end? In Jerusalem. So it goes out to come back in. Does that sound familiar? When the Bible describes the wind that blows upon the face of the earth, the Bible says every day wind originates from the north, which is the center of the earth, and blows to the outer rim. And then once again, through the circuit of the firmament, it comes back to the north. That is how we have wind. So when you're going to California, your plane uses less gas than when it is coming because of the fact that one is flying with the wind and the other is flying against the wind. Does it make sense? So we see these things in our daily life. So we know that it is true that there is a circuit of the wind that goes out from the north to the south and then comes right back. The gospel is that wind also that is supposed to bring life everywhere it goes. If the wind from the north stops blowing, nothing happens. We can barely breathe. There will be no rain. There will be no pollination. There's not going to be anything going on. So we need that wind of the Spirit of God coming from the north to the south and then coming right back again. The gospel is the same thing coming from Jerusalem, going out to the ends of the earth, but it is meant to echo and resound back to Jerusalem. If you're wondering why there is war in Palestine, that's why. We call it Palestine today, but the original name for Palestine is what? Judea. What we call Palestine today that you hear in the news, Palestine, Palestine. Satan would do things like that so that when the time comes, we miss the signs because we no longer know the new names. And so if there is peace 
in Palestine, the gospel will be preached and then it will make his way back to Jerusalem and the end will come. Jesus says the end will not come until this gospel of the kingdom has been preached to the end of the earth. Then the end will come because once it gets to the end of the earth, nothing stops it. It moves through the firmament and it comes back. But guess what? The devil is mounting a stronghold in Palestine because he doesn't want the gospel to penetrate Judea. Because the moment the gospel penetrates Judea, then Jesus will appear upon the Mount of Olives. As I was reading now, as we were reading, I was reminded of that because the ministry of John the Baptist started in Judea. And we are the forerunners. We are the voices of him crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. We need to intercede for what is going on in that region. The Bible says pray for Jerusalem and pray for her peace because when she has peace, then you will have peace. Remember one of the most important meetings of our lifestyle of our lifetime to discuss the peace of Jerusalem happened the Monday after Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. And people thought, oh, that was bad behavior. No, that was strategic planning by the enemy to keep us all distracted. That night into the morning, we were supposed to be praying for Jerusalem. On Tuesday, the Lord said we have to be intercessors. So if you haven't started interceding and you're looking for prayer points, you're welcome. You can start with that one. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the road that leads to Jerusalem from Judea to open up once again that the gospel might return to where he started from. Because until that happens, it's just going to be darkness and corruption and darkness and corruption. Let's keep reading on. Verse 3 says, For this is he who was spoken of by prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one, crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Before we get into this, I shared with you, maybe on Tuesday or Saturday last week, that one of the ways by which you studied the word of God effectively is to speak the word of God while you're studying it. To not just read it. And I hope you all have been practicing that. It makes a whole world of difference, doesn't it? Number one, he helps you to stay awake. He helps you to cover more grounds. You understand what I mean? When you're, you see, we have, we have no shortage of distraction in this generation that if we attempt to read the Bible by just looking at the words, don't kid yourself, it's not as dramatic as watching reels on TikTok. And because our minds have been exposed to a lot of moving pictures, when we are merely reading, before you know what's going on, you just space out. You find yourself trying to read Matthew chapter one alone, and you started two, two weeks ago, and you haven't even gotten to where the name of Joseph appears in the genealogy. Because when you start reading it, Oh, and these are the generations of the people from Noah to David and David to this and that. After a while, you're like, oh my God, I need to quickly text this person. And by the time you text that person, then they call you. And you're like, oh my God, I'll just quickly talk to them for five minutes. 50 minutes later, you are tired and now you're hungry. Because all the energy within you that is meant to be for studying the word of God, you have expended it talking about Sandra that lives across the street. And rather than praying for Palestine, you first of all pray for forgiveness because now you feel very dirty. And you're like, oh God, take the coal from the altar, cleanse my lips, here I am. And then after that, you're like, oh, I've prayed, I've studied two verses, I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> Jesus says, it is, it is not for you to commend yourself until I say your work is done. But many of us, when we read two verses, we're like, at least I'm better than the other person who hasn't even read anything in four years. The Bible says, they that compare themselves to themselves are not wise. You want to beat your own record of how many scriptures you studied last week. You understand what I mean? And so when you read it out loud, what do you experience? You experience more alertness and focus. If I let me even share with you one, if you can read the Bible on your phone, or maybe even a, a, a natural Bible is not that heavy, you can carry it around and walk. Just make sure you're walking in a place where there's room so that you don't stumble. You see what I mean? So you do that 
so that you maximize the time. You read it out loud. I shared that with you. Now let me share with you one more thing. In fact, that which I shared with you is also a good one, which is read it standing. Don't sit down to read it. The Bible says, and Jesus stood up to read. When Jesus was reading in the synagogue, he stood to read. You understand what I mean? And so when you stand to read, it gives you more focus. Why am I saying that? Because the Lord's revealed to me a lot of strategies that the enemy is using against people today to keep them from studying the word of God. When you renew your commitment to spending time with God in prayer and in the study of the word of God, you need guardrails. You need to set for yourself certain limits. Don't leave it to chance until your muscles have been very well exercised. Before then, five chapters at a minimum. When you're reading out loud, to be honest, you will do 10 chapters just like that. Last night, I was feeling very sleepy, very tired, and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to pray. And the Holy Spirit said, you already know how that is going to go. Yeah. You see, you don't have to kid yourself. You're trying to overcome Satan when you have not overcome yourself. You understand what I mean? Jesus was not even, Satan did not even come to tempt Jesus until Jesus had had to overcome himself. 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, praying and fasting, he overcame himself. Because if you ask Josephine to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, and that goes for every one of us. You see what I mean? You need to overcome yourself. Satan, Satan is not even paying attention to you just yet. Because he knows that you are capable of keeping yourself from fulfilling destiny just with your own bad habits and your flesh alone. You understand what I'm saying? So there are times where we're blaming the enemy for blowing sleep in our faces and Satan is like, really? I, I didn't even pay attention to you. You understand what I mean? Because you say, oh, it must be Satan that is making me sleep every night when I want to study the word of God. The Bible says they that sleep, sleep at night. At night you're supposed to be tired and you're supposed to sleep. If you're really serious about studying the word of God, make time in the day while you're still active. You understand what I mean? But you don't. You spend every time doing everything else. Do you know what people do, Antoine? People say, oh, once I'm done with all of my checklist, and then I will get in the word of God. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Your heart does not want to change. Your heart does not want to submit to the word of God because the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. It's enmity against God. And so what's going to happen is your mind is going to play tricks on you all through the day to make sure that you never finish that checklist until you're fully exhausted. And when you're tired, your mind will ridicule you and say, oh, all your checklist is done. You want to study the word now? And then you fall asleep. And then you start binding the devil. The devil is like, save your chains for yourself. I'm not even near you. So let me encourage you. Be true to God and be sincere with yourself. So the Holy Spirit said to me, you already know how that is going to go. So I was like, okay, so what do we do? He says, study the word. Why would he say that? Because the Holy Spirit knows that when I study the word, I get so excited. I get so fired up, even if it's the same thing that I read yesterday. He gets so excited because my soul has been instructed to delight in the Lord. David says, I have more understanding than the ancient and I know more than my teachers because my soul delight in your statutes. Every time I open the word of God, sometimes I, I read one verse and I start to break dance. And it's like, what did you just read? I just read John 3, 16, for God's soul loved the world. And it's like, come on, Pastor Moses, you're just being dramatic. Yeah, you all didn't see that. Yeah, when I first met my wife, sometimes she thought I was, she used to call me an acting king, which is kind of like the opposite of drama queen. Yeah, she still called me that sometimes. You know, the other day we were watching one of the teachings here and she was like, why are you always doing this? And doing that. <laughs> she said, oh, too much drama. Yeah. And, and when she said it, I was like, well, makes sense. She was like, now that I've said it, even you will begin to see it. She said, after a while, he comes and he's like, oh, this and that. And then sometimes he's sucking. And, and I started to notice, and I was like, okay, I get it. But it is not intentional. It is just how excited I am at the word of God. 
I get so delighted. I don't follow sports. So I save all of my excitement. So the same way you scream and shout when Falcons is getting beaten. That is the way I get excited when the world is coming into my soul. I keep saying that because I don't think I've ever seen them win. So don't judge me. Pray for them. So here is the deal, y'all. When you take the word of God, until you build that delight in the word of God, you need to put your body under. You need to create certain constraints for yourself. Read the Bible. And so the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what's going to happen if you try to pray now? I will pray, but it might have been one of those. You know, there are times you pray like that. Yeah. And you say you're praying. Do you know one of the things that I do now? I pray until my watch tells me that I have exercised. My watch tells me that I've exercised when I have done activity equivalent to brisk walking. So when I'm praying, the watch, the watch, even the watch does not register it. But when I'm praying, it registers that I am doing something. Because prayer is fun. Let me tell you something that happened to me recently. One day, we had just finished the one hour prayer on Instagram. I mean, we had just spoken in tongues for one straight hour under the leadership of Brother Alan. And you know, when Alan is leading prayer, that one hour is one hour. It's not like some people that will join late and apologize for 17 minutes and give announcements for the last 17 minutes. So they really only prayed for 12. No, we start speaking in tongues, boom, 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 boom. And as soon as we were done, I was hoping that the men of God would catch some rest. And then Alan called me. And it was like, oh, well, I was praying. I saw this and I saw that. And I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> but the Bible says a false witness is an abomination. But he who hears, he who hears shall speak expressly. My spirit immediately bore witness to what he was saying. And I was taken up in a vision. I was talking to him as someone on the phone. But the immediate environment that I was in had changed into that of some angels in worship before the Lord. So for like another 30 minutes or so, we were at it. I was describing to him what I was seeing. Even after praying, I almost couldn't sit down for like another hour. I was that fired up. That experience awaits every believer. But until you get there, you need to first of all put your body under. You need to regiment your flesh and your desires and bring them into submission. Make your soul fall in love with the word of God. Do whatever it takes. So what did I do? I said, okay, it was about 11 o'clock. I said, from here till 11.30, I am going to read the Bible out loud because I know that would fire me up. And so I set an alarm. I said, set an alarm for 11.30. So what did I do? Between that time, about 10.52 or so, and 11.30, I was reading scriptures out loud. I read about 19 chapters of Psalms within about 40 minutes. <laughs> you, you can do the same. I'm not even the fastest reader in the room. You see what I mean? But because I was walking, I was reading out loud, there was no distraction. My mind was not wandering. It's difficult for your mind to wander when you walk. You know why? Because walking is one of the most dangerous things we do. So the, God designed the human being to have alertness when you're walking because you don't want to stumble, you don't want to fall. And so everything about you becomes alert. Try it. Okay, we're going to land this plane right now because of the fact that this thing that I was about to get to in Matthew chapter 3 as a continuation from where we left off on Tuesday would take us more time than we have. So this is what I'm going to do. Like I said, I still want us to pray. Remember where I started this conversation from? Enoch was caught up because he was a man who was possessed with the knowledge of God, of the things of heaven and the things of the earth more than anyone who lived before him. Not even his father Abraham, Adam, who would occasionally, not occasionally, very regularly have conversations with God. Enoch knew more than everybody else and then he was taken up. And the Bible says that the generation that is coming of the last days, they will experience the knowledge of the glory of God that shall fill the earth. And guess what's going to happen? They also will be caught up. And so we see that there is a correlation between being filled with the word of God and being caught up. And so if we will hear what 
the, prophet, the trumpets are saying, then we need to have the substance within us because deep calls to deep. We do not hear only what is being said. We hear what is within. I have proven that to you before. If I suddenly look at Kenyatta and I start speaking to her in French, it's, it's just going to be sounds. No message because there's no French inside. But when I speak to her in English, because there is already English vocabulary inside, she will hear what I am saying. Does that make sense? And so in order for you to be able to interpret the trumpets when they sound, you need to fill yourself with the word of God because the Bible says the trumpets will sound how? At the word of the Lord. So if the trumpets are rooted in the word of God, then your understanding of what the trumpets are saying has to be equally rooted in the word of God. When the Holy Spirit came and that sound of Acts chapter 2 verse 2 was as of a rushing mighty wind, it was a rushing mighty wind to the people who were without, but to the apostles, it was the instruction for activation. And they immediately engaged the Holy Spirit because they heard that behold, the comforter. They knew that that was the Holy Spirit simply because Jesus already put the word on the inside of them so they know what to expect. There's a lot going on in the world today. For you to be able to withstand in the evil day, you need the word of God. I am trying to sell you on the word of God. Because I know your life depends on it just as mine depends on it. Especially in the times that we're in. And what you have is what you give. There is not much else that I have other than the love for this word of God. And you can tell that I love this word of God. And I know that it is life to those who find them. The Bible says, and it is health to all their flesh. There was a time that I was getting lazy. You can ask my wife as a witness. I was getting lazy when it comes to the study of the word of God. I was feeling like, yeah, I've read that before. I'll do these other things. In fact, I convinced myself that there were certain things that my mates were doing when I was in my late teens and early 20s that I didn't do because I was studying the Word of God. So I'm like, maybe it's time for me to catch up. I'm going to learn a new business language. I'm going to do this and do that. And so I was cutting back on my Bible study time. If my back wasn't aching, my feet would be aching. I spent thousands of dollars with chiropractors and countless hours getting beat up for no reason. Yeah, getting physical therapy. He was chiropractor, physical therapy, massage. I did the stretching. I did the compressing. I did the cupping. I, in fact, there was once I did the punching. They introduced me to a Korean physical therapist. The beating was like being persecuted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The first time I went there and she beat me for three days, I could barely eat. And they told me that, yeah, it's, it's expected. I'm like, of course, when you beat somebody like that, it is expected for their body to ache. But then after a while, I came to my senses. And I'm like, the Bible says that the word of God is life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. My sister was like, what, what, what solution are you using for your hair? Because we have photos of you with your hairline already receding. It is the word of God. My hair started coming back. But I have yet to find the verse that reverses gray hair though. But I'm not looking for it. The Bible says that gray hair is desirable if the head upon whom it is found is in the way of righteousness. So I'm not afraid of gray hair. But at the end of the day, the whole story is that we need to prepare and there is no preparation that supersedes the study of the word of God. God forbid that anybody that has come in contact with me and communion house will pass and not fall in love with the word of God. You see, because our mission is to make disciples of men. If there's anything that we have, when was the last time you went somewhere where they preached for 90 minutes every time? When Tia started coming here, she was like, you people are different. Other churches, they'll just give you like 15, 20 minutes. She was stylishly telling me that, dude, you are the doer of the most. And I'm like, that's what we do here. We just get right into the word. Because it works. It is health to all their flesh. 
I'm encouraging you, try it. So one last thing that I'm going to share with you as we break bread is this. And thank you, Holy Spirit, because I was so excited when he told me to share it with you all. I want to tell you something about the dreams that you're having in this season. Your dreams are not from Satan. If Satan can get into your dreams, oh my goodness, he would do it all day long because it's so easy. Because many of us will believe in the dreams that we have. But when you look through scriptures, even when unbelievers have dreams in scriptures, it comes from where? It comes from the Lord. When Pharaoh had dreams, it did not come from Ra. It came from the father of creation. When Cyrus had his dreams, when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar how do y'all say it again? Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, because I say mine the old school way. When he had his dreams, where did they come from? They came from the Lord. And so the Holy Spirit said, there are many of my brothers and sisters who have been troubled by the dreams that have been given to them by heaven to reveal to them things that they must know. And let me give you my own personal testimony. I had a dream not too long ago. And in the dream, I had some things that I said, well, these things are not enough. I need more of it. And even the little that I had, some strong men came looking like hoodlums. And they wanted to take it from me. And I started to plead with them. And then I woke up. And the Holy Spirit said to me, okay, you were pleading with them. I was so ashamed of myself. You don't plead with the enemy. You don't plead with your flesh. If your flesh is not letting you study the word of God, don't plead with it. Bring it into subjection. Command it. I was pleading with strong men with demonic forces forces that I was supposed to bring under subjection. The Bible says you will resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, ordinarily, I would have been devastated because of the end of the dream. But I was excited because it was one night in particular that I went to bed and I asked God, you know me, those who know me, you know that from time to time, I will ask God on some nights to give me a dream reflecting where I am in the parts of me that I cannot see. In Psalms chapter 51, David says, you know me, you reveal truth to me in my inward parts. And I'm like, if the Lord is the one that is searching me by my spirit, the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with, with which the Lord searches the inward parts of his belly. Then whatever you find, oh God, reveal to me, carry me along in this work of development that you're doing in me. So I would ask God, I want to see where I'm at in my subconscious because I don't want to be a double-minded man. I don't want to be quoting scriptures and believing in my consciousness, something that is different from what I have in my subconsciousness. Because then that will make me a double-minded man. And the Bible says, let not the double-minded man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. So what do I do? I ask the Lord to give me an update of where I'm at. So that night I prayed and I knew that there was a reason why I needed to press in. I said, Lord, visit me tonight by the ministry of your angels and let me see where I'm at. And so when I woke up from that dream, I'm like, okay, you see where you are now? Are you happy? There is work to be done. So I spent days after that praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you don't exercise your muscles enough and then you become weak. What you don't use, you lose. So I tell you, I share that testimony with you so that you know that the dreams that you're having are essentially heaven's simulations to let you know what God is saying to you or where you're at. So take those dreams back to the ones who gave them, back to the one who gave them to you. And say, Father, I am not afraid. I am thankful that you have shown me this. Now, what would you have me do? How do we go about this if it's not clear to you? Most times, if you bring, take it back to God, immediately you will know exactly what he is telling you and you will start working on it. So let us rise up to break bread and we're going to read from Psalms one, Psalm 11 verse 3. Yeah, the book of Psalms, chapter 11. And that will be our breaking bread scripture for today. I know we'll go through quite a bit of scriptures here, some that I don't even give you references to, but you can find them on your own. Google them if you must. 
So Psalms 11 verse 3. The Bible says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. So as we break bread today, I want you to take those two things to heart and bring them before the Lord. The Lord is saying, you have become my righteousness in Christ. But if the foundation is not fixed, you are limited even though I have empowered you. You see what I mean? And so there are tests that you are being made subject to on the daily basis to help reveal the fault in the foundations of your life so you can partner with God to resolve it so that you can begin to deliver on your assignment. Does it make sense? The Bible says if the foundation is faulty, what can the righteous do? The righteous cannot do much. What is your foundation? Your subconscious mind. Everything else is built on top of it. So how do you fix that? The Lord allows for you to be tested. You're tested a lot in dreams. To see whether you will run when you see a beast. To let you know that you're not as confident in God as you should be. To let you know if you will embrace people in the dream or if you will beat them up. To let you know that you're living in unforgiveness. Or maybe you have unresolved conflicts with people. God will reveal these things. You sons of men are being tested because God wants to fix your foundation. So as we break bread today, I want you to say, Lord, examine my heart and show me great and mighty things which I do not know. Reveal to me the truth about my inward parts that I may repent, that I may renew my mind, that I may humble myself before you and that I may grow thereby bearing fruits that give you glory in the name of Jesus. The Lord wants you to pass the test and that's why he's giving you the scriptures and he has also given you the Holy Spirit. So as we break bread today, break bread and surrender before the Lord and say to him like David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. The Lord wants to fix that foundation and is doing it via test and Jesus passed his test and you will pass yours too if you will abide in him. And so Jesus says, if you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, then you have a part in me. So this is the way you're going to overcome by remaining in him. And how do you remain in him? By, remind, rem, by being reminded of the sacrifices that he made. Do this, he says, in remembrance of me. You may eat the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, may Koro Shutalamanda Kasoto the Dedicated Ball. There is power mighty in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. The power to save, the power to deliver. And I want you to call on the Lord and say, Lord, I have my hands raised, lift me up. Draw me close to you and never let me go. Bring me in by the blood of the Lamb. The Lord said that the covenant that I have with you is a covenant that is cut by sacrifice. And thankfully, it is not your sacrifice, but it is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And so now you may come boldly before the throne of grace by the blood of the Lamb that speaks better things than the blood of righteous Abel. I 
I come by the blood of Jesus cleansed and sanctified draw in by the blood of Jesus even this very moment say Lord draw me close to you I want to press in if you are standing here today and you know in your heart that this word has been for you and you're saying brother Moses thank God for you and thank God for this invitation that has come through your obedience today I receive this invitation to get closer I receive this invitation to sit at the foot of Jesus. I receive these invitation asking me to prioritize the things of the word of God. I am repentant in my heart, but I know that I cannot do it alone. I need help. If that is you today, I want you to raise your hand and say, Lord, you are my help. You are the one that will perform the things that you have asked of me. The things that you have declared concerning me will be performed by you. Let your grace be available by your favor, by your mercy for me to be steadfast in the things of the kingdom, for me to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Make that recommitment before the Lord today. If you want me to pray with you, additionally, you can come forward. It'd be my delight to lay hands on you if you want to come forward. And for everyone that is standing in here today, I want you to lay hold of the fire from the altar and take that home with you to ignite the presence of God in your home. To ignite the presence of God in your home so that there is light everywhere in your home. The light of God's love, the light of His countenance that brings deliverance, the light of His countenance that brings victory, the light of His countenance that brings understanding. Lay hold of it. For that one, you don't even have to come here because this is, this is holy ground you can just by faith lay hold of the presence of God in the mighty name of Jesus Father I thank you for your word says blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled Father in Jesus name I thank you because of the divine hunger and thirst for your word for your face for your presence, for your touch. If we are hungry for your word, as we are hungry for food, Lord, we shall be filled. If we are thirsty for your word, as the deer is thirsty for water, we shall be filled. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, in this place today, fill us, fill us, every one of us, with the hunger and the thirst for your word. And so I want to encourage you, you can just open your eyes and come forth this way. I'm just going to lay my hands on you. In the mighty name of Jesus, be filled with the hunger and thirst for the word of God and for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the hunger and thirst for the word of God and for the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. I see you waking up in the night to study. In the mighty name of Jesus, be filled with hunger and thirst for the word of God and for the Holy Spirit. You will hear the voice of God expounding the word to you by the Holy Spirit. Let there be light. Let there be illumination now in the mighty name of Jesus. I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are in your dwelling place forever take me to the place where you are 
I just want to be with you. Father, we thank you because of your presence. Let us long for your presence. I want to be where you are, oh God. I want to enter boldly into your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory in your presence. That's where I always want to be. Father, I just want to be with you. I want you to learn that song, sing that song, or find one that is similar. Beg and plead for his presence so that you don't have to ever beg for anything else. Long for his presence so that you never want for anything else. That's where I always want to be. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let there be a divine hunger and thirst. Now in the mighty name of Jesus. He's your heart is bursting forth like a fountain longing for the glory of God Father in the mighty name of Jesus I thank you because you have begun a good work in this man and he who has begun a good work is faithful and just to bring it to a perfect completion so right now in the mighty name of Jesus a deep hunger for your word. Let your eyes let your heart be aware of the things that easily beset you. Those things that easily distract you let them be revealed to you so that you can save God against distraction and give yourself wholly to the study of the word of God and to prayer. Give yourself to the ministry of the word and prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, every stronghold of the enemy in, what, in the foundations of your heart that, would, that could keep you from receiving understanding, let them be uprooted right from this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your heart be renewed. I want you to say, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this man's heart becomes the good soil that takes in the good seed of your word and brings forth a hundredfold in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to pray for both of you together. You were the reason, by the grace of God, that that second prayer request came forth about having the presence of God in your home. As soon as both of you stood, that was what I saw. The presence of God enveloping your conversations. The presence of God being the foundations of your plans. I want you to come closer if you can. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because these ones are here today that you may touch them. Let them experience your touch. The supernatural begins now in your walk with the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the logical, but now it is the season of the supernatural, the inexplicable, dynamic working of God in your home. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the presence of God as it was in the house of Obed-Edom, let it be upon their home in the mighty name of Jesus. Let there be light that illuminates even the light of your word in their home in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord receives you today. He receives the repentance of your heart. He receives the commitment that you're making in your heart before the Lord today. And he graces you by the countenance of his face, by his favor and his mercy. He graces you with that which your heart desires, which is consistency 
in the place of the study of the word of God. You will hear him continually. You will sing praises. You will burst forth as before, singing praises unmeditated. It's not premeditated, but you're just singing praises. Your heart, like David said, will overflow with a good theme. And that theme will be the things of the presence of God. Your spirit will begin to describe that which he sees in the presence of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, let this that has been ignited in this place, Lord, continue to burn in their homes, even the fire of the altar, and nothing will put it out. No conflict will put it out. No doubt will put it out. No noise of the enemy will put it out. But it will continue to burn as a holy convocation to the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you will say, seek me and you will find me. Oh, there is a lot of understanding that God has for you in the place of teaching. So, when they want to gossip, teach them the word. When they call just to entertain themselves because they like talking to you, teach them the word. And as you continue to teach, even you will be consolidated in the understanding of the word of God. The Lord is allowing for you to drink from the well as you feed others. As you draw to fill up their cups, the Lord will fill you up in the mighty name of Jesus. This is your season of receiving understanding. You see, the Bible says, he that waters himself shall be watered. The Lord is going to water you with deep insight even as you're sharing. You will try to contain yourself on the phone and when they're gone, you'll be like, oh my God, I didn't even know that. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this season in my sister's life. The candle has been lit and you will walk in the light. Praise the Lord. Anybody else that I haven't prayed for that came out? Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord is opening another window to you. He says, I am pointing to him another window. You have been looking. There are windows that the Lord has given you access to. You have been looking and you have been seeing things that are somewhat unbelievable. They have invited you to come and look through this window. You have seen through that window. You have seen through this window. And the Lord says they're pointing to you again another window. And this one is immediate. It is immediate. Another dimension is opening up to you in the realm of the spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. So this is what the Lord revealed to me. The Lord is revealing to me that you will be brought in to see where the animal of sacrifice has been prepared. You have been in the outer court and you have seen the smoke rise up and you have perceived the fragrance of the burnt offering. But the Lord is bringing you in to where it has been prepared. Earlier today, I saw that you were seeking the Lord for the grace to interpret dreams. You presented before the Lord and I says, Lord, I don't want to keep calling Pastor Moses. I want to be able to interpret. When I tell him my dreams, he tells me the interpretation. I'm locking in with you. That's what the Lord revealed to me. Is that not so? The Lord is saying that he has heard you. He has seen you. Oh yeah, and now it is yours. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let God is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. 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 Oh, woman of God. Thank you, Father, for the bricks that she has loaded up. You are the builder. Let the scriptures now begin to be. The scriptures are becoming pictures. For you, they are becoming images. They are becoming insight. They are becoming wisdom. In the mighty name of Jesus. And then finally, authority over the enemy. In the mighty name of Jesus. So the Lord is equipping you to fight that which has plagued those who are close to you. Family members, extended family members. The Lord is equipping you. And the authority to break bonds, to break the bonds of wickedness. You have been brought into that authority in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Let us be seated one minute. Praise God. God is good. Celebrate Jesus. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. God is good. All right, please take this for me. God is good. Amen, amen, amen. You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way that it should go. And when it's grown, it will not depart from it. 
And so this is the time for you to help form your children in these things. Encourage them to hunger and thirst for the word of God. Let's proceed it quickly. I've got like a couple of announcements to make. And then Alan is going to come to receive the offering and, um, and to pray over the offering. So uh, two weeks ago, or maybe a week and a half ago, I thought we had been told about the Christmas party of Tuesday, the 20th. Right, but apparently I was jumping the gun. It was, you know, at, a, at the uh, prayer meeting that we discussed it, but no one's told everybody just yet. So um, this Tuesday, God willing, we're going to be having a Christmas party. Um, so it's just going to be kind of like an elaboration of the family dinner that we do, right? And so um, the instructions: if you're here and you're not in the WhatsApp group, can I see your hand? If you're not yet in the WhatsApp group, Tia, you need to join the WhatsApp group. Please join her, sign her up. Because you're not there, please help me sign her up. Because what is best to do is to see the instructions written so that that way you don't forget. But basically what we're encouraging is just maybe spend about $20, buy a gift that you know you can bring so we can, we can have sort of like a gift exchange. But if that is not in your budget for the season or you're not being led to do so, don't worry about it, just show up. There is gonna be enough to go around. Okay, but as much as possible, I want to encourage you, bring one or two things that you will wrap up nicely and put in the, in, the, in the trough, and then we can all get to share it so that everybody walks out of here with one or two things. Alrighty, and so that is one. And secondly, are, are people encouraged to bring food or is, yeah, so it's going to be potluck as usual, right? God is good. Anything else that is crucial? Okay, alrighty, so it's this Tuesday by the grace of God. It's going to be at 6.30. We have a lot to do, so if you can come in and beat that traffic, please do so. Pray before you leave home and leave early, you know, so that the, the, the Lord can make a way where there is no way. Alrighty, so that is one thing. And then, we, let me give you an insight, because we will have a quiz, and God's raised up a family that is packaging some very, very good presents or prizes to be won from the quiz competition. So the quiz competition is going to be about the life of Jesus. So which is not that difficult because between now and Tuesday, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So now you have an incentive. Come on, I thought you were going to be excited about that. You have an, I told you before, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have only 89 chapters. But I would encourage you, read Acts chapter 1, because Acts chapter 1, in my opinion, is part of the Gospels, because Jesus was still there speaking to his disciples as he would in the book of Mark. And so when you add Acts chapter 1, what do you have? 90 chapters. Come on. If you read it out loud, I guarantee you, you can read all of that in one day. You see what I mean? Oh yeah. What did I tell you last time I was here? that it takes about five and a half hours to read all of the 150 or so chapters in the book of Psalms, if you would read it out loud. And so, read about the life of Jesus, because the quiz is going to be primarily on the life of Jesus, which also includes Joseph and Mary. It's easy. There are only about three chapters that focus on Joseph and Mary. You read Matthew chapter 1, and then you read Luke chapter 1 and 2, and then you'll be fine. I'm giving you insights because I want you to win these prizes. It would be a shame if we have to take the prizes home. You see what I mean? And so there are about maybe, I think there are about 137 questions. We may not ask all of them. We'll pick and choose. Yeah, so, but then after the quiz, maybe we'll give you the question and answers to all the, or, or keep using it every Christmas. Yeah, anyway, we're yet to decide. But there'll be a quiz competition and it's about the life of Jesus, a little bit about Joseph and Mary and the donkey that they rode. And um, yeah, I'm not going to say more than that. But study, be prepared, and you can win something fabulous for your family. One of the things that I'm thinking of throwing in, I haven't decided, but I want to throw in a weekend getaway for a family. So if Kenyatta, if Kenyatta wins, then she goes to go to a resort in Stone Mountain for one night. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So if Chris wins, if Chris is the one that wins, then himself and his family. And so what that means is we're not just going to get you the standard room, we're going to get you a suite where you can be with your family. Oh yeah, yeah. Say that again. Oh yeah, the golf resort is included. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because I want, I want it to be, you know, yeah. so have you been speaking to people? Yeah. Oh yeah. So basically, 
there is, it's going to be fun. So I want to encourage you, come, and then if you can bring one or two people, go ahead and bring them. There's going to be enough to go around. All righty, God bless you. Alan? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. What a time in the Lord tonight. Let's give God praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to get ready to worship in our giving. I want to encourage us with this. Now, I got my secret compartment here. How many of us have these, I was going to call them business cards, but kingdom business cards? Come on now. We're going to do a big push going into 2023 to invite, okay? We want to press in. We want to press in. Uh, I was listening to our dear brother John a couple of days ago and how he was just sharing how many people desire to do right, to understand the deep things of God that want a relationship, but their immediate environment is just not conducive to it. They don't know where to go. And it could just take us. The scriptures say, arise, shine, for your light has come. It just takes us showing up to sow that seed. Hey, this is the house that I'm a part of. I want you to come check us out. See us online. See what we do. You see we're giving out resort giveaways and, and all type of things here. So there are plenty of incentive that we encourage that fellowship, but we really want to be intentional. So I expect everyone, if you don't have any, even if you have some, take some more. We're going to be passing these out. Come see me. I'm going to come find you. Matter of fact, who has not taken any? Raise your hand. Okay, my brother Antoine, my brother Chris is why. Okay, we're going to get you hooked up, all right, because we want you guys to pass these out. So uh, in the spirit of giving, I want to encourage us with this as the offering details are on the screen. The book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 8, it reads, But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. We give God praise because this is good ground here, communion house, but we know that the rainy season has been declared over us. While it's still raining, we still have the opportunity to plant seed. We still have the opportunity to put that seed down in our giving. If the Lord has been dealing with you about somebody and blessing someone with this or that, go ahead and do it. This is your time to do it because we want to aim for that hundredfold and I believe by faith we can do that thing. Again, the details are here. We're going to give everybody a couple of minutes just to get our offering prepared and we're going to lift it up before the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. We thank you, O oh God, for your word that has entered into our hearts this night, oh God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that speaks expressly. Lord, as you have led us this far, as you lead us in our giving, oh God, bring to our remembrance every act, oh God, that you have placed upon our heart, being led of you to give, to be a blessing to someone, to be a blessing, uh, an act of service, oh God, even to this house. Lord, bring to remembrance those things, oh God, that we may do. For we know that the window is still open for us to plant seed, for us to sow, oh God, for we know indeed that the harvest is upon, is upon us. Lord, we thank you and give you praise, for we know that it's you, by your hand and by your hand alone, that you give seed to the sower. Lord, let us as sowers be pleasing in your sight. Master gardener, come and see about your fields. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. All righty. Don't forget about Tuesday. I'm excited for that. Y'all want to get here on time so we can come and press in. We're going to have an awesome time of trivia and games, also worship and ministry. Okay, some special song selections as well. So I'm excited for that. All righty. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for keeping us and protecting us on our way in. Lord, we ask that you command your angels to take charge of us as we go forth tonight. Oh God, that we dash not our foot against the stone. Lord, we thank you for sweet sleep even tonight, Lord, and help us to further understand, reveal your mysteries to us in the night season. All glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. All righty. Have a blessed week.